I wonder if any of you have had an experience like this. The other day, Mandy and I bought a pedestal fan. And there was more than just a little assembly required to put this thing together. And if you know me at all, I'm going to be a little transparent with you. Is that okay? When it comes to, like, home repair stuff, I'm completely useless. Even Jesus has not been able to do much with me in that regard uh, my entire life. So Mandy and my daughter Ray put it together. And when it was all done, they plugged it in, and it worked great. And then they realized there was a bag of parts that they had not used. Has that ever happened to you? Mm -hmm. The part they missed didn't actually have anything to do with the function of the fan. Thank goodness. It was all aesthetic. They were little covers to put over the screws that were in the bottom of the pedestal. But not all parts are like that, are they? Right now, the AC in my car doesn't work. Now, that's not a big deal. It's February. Well, that's not quite accurate either. The AC works fine, but all that comes out is heat. The controls on the dash work fine. The fan works. The AC unit is fine. The problem is there's a little motor in there that connects the controls of the dashboard to the AC unit in the car. And that's not working. Without it, you can't change the temperature setting. That part is essential for controlling the temperature of the car. The essential parts of the Christian life consist in the great commandment and the great commission. And we've been calling this the irreducible core. A Christian is someone who loves God through Christ with all of their heart and soul and mind and loves their neighbor as themselves and is someone who's making disciples as they go through life, baptizing them, baptizing them and teaching them to obey everything that Jesus commanded, which is all summed up in the great commandment, love God and love your neighbor as yourself. Love God, love others, make disciples. The Christian life includes a lot of other things than that, but it doesn't include less than that. And our text for this morning, Philippians 3, 17 to 4, 9, begins and ends with a call to follow Paul's example. And since we've had a lot going on in the service, I'm going to read to you the two verses that I'm really focused on for this uh, message today. Philippians 3.17. Paul says, Join together in following my example, brothers and sisters, just as you have us as a model Keep your eyes on those who live as we do. And Philippians 4, 9, whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put it into practice and the God of peace will be with you. These two verses are going to be the focus of our message this morning, but let me Take a moment to put those into a little bit of context so that you understand what Paul's getting at. In chapter 1, starting at verse 9, I think we get the purpose of Paul's letter. That your love may abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight, so that you may be able to discern what is best and may be pure and blameless for the day of Christ. That's what this letter is about. Love, as we have seen over the last three weeks, is at the heart of the gospel. To mature their faith, they need love for God and they need love for others. They need this love not only to be there in their lives, they need it to be abounding there in their lives. The rest of the letter spells out how they are to live in such a way that Paul's prayer is going to be answered. First, he tells them how his imprisonment hasn't hampered his ministry at all. Can you believe that? 
The guy's in prison, but that doesn't matter. Things are still going swimmingly as far as the gospel is concerned. In fact, it's helped to advance it, he says. Paul tells them how he's still making disciples even while he's under arrest. Not only that, but Paul's commitment to follow the Great Commission, even in prison, has encouraged those outside to do the same. Then in chapter 1, starting at verse 19, Paul tells them that he's been lifted up by their prayers and concern for him and has been encouraged by them. And while it would be better for him to leave and be with Christ, he's convinced that for their sake it was better that he remain. Paul was modeling for them how to love your neighbor as yourself. Or as he says later in chapter 2, starting at verse 3, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. As Christ was humble, they should be humble. As Christ put their needs ahead of his own, they should put the needs of others ahead of their own. Jesus lived out the great commandment through the incarnation so that he could be a servant to them, so that he could show them what it meant to live a life of love that looked out for the interests of others. And while learning to love your neighbor as yourself is difficult and hard, and yes, it's even messy at times, they should do it without grumbling or complaining as Christ did. And doing so would make them shine like the stars in the sky, Paul says in chapter 2, verse 15. Knowing that such love is best learned by seeing and experiencing it, Paul tells them that he's sending Epaphroditus with his letter and Timothy soon after and plans to follow himself when he's able. Chapter 3 opens with the command to rejoice in the Lord. In order to protect that joy and the love they have for God, they need to be on their guard against legalists. Paul knows from experience that legalism is the enemy of joy. Knowing and loving Jesus is everything. Nothing is to be gained. In fact, everything will be lost if their dependence is on anything other than Christ. All the work to secure their relationship with God was done by Christ. But that doesn't mean you can live any way you wish, he says. Rather, they should live up to what they've already attained in Christ. And therefore, Paul says, to follow his example and others who live as he does. Their citizenship in heaven is in heaven, and they need to act according to that reality. And therefore, they need to work to resolve conflict. They need to rejoice in the Lord. They need to love him and let the joy of that love abound. And when it does, gentleness will abound. And conflicts will therefore be few and far between. Thanksgiving and prayer will bring peace. And that peace is going to transcend all understanding and cut the roots of anxiety. Love for God will lead them to see and focus on what is true, on what is noble and right and pure and lovely and admirable and excellent. And then we come to verse 9 in chapter 4. Whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put into practice, and the God of peace will be with you. Learned or received, that means the gospel and his letters. Heard from me or seen in me, that's referring to how he lived with them when he was there in person. His love for God and Christ, his love for others, and his commitment to making disciples. All three of these, they need to practice. Paul was not just imparting knowledge to them. He was imparting a way of life. Discipleship starts with illumination from the Spirit in which we see the loveliness of God. 
when we see the great love he has for us in Christ and convinces us of our need for Christ and of our identity as his sons and daughters. That illumination not only reveals the glory of God and the love he has for us, but sparks in us a love for him and Christ and the Holy Spirit too. That illumination leads to and assumes incarnation. As the Father's love was incarnated in Jesus and Jesus' love was incarnated in the life of Paul to the Philippians, Jesus wants to see his love incarnated through us to one another. Love for God always leads to loving our neighbor as ourselves. That's what we talked about last week. Incarnation naturally leads to impartation. Discipleship is learning Jesus' way of life to become like him. But it doesn't stop there. Discipleship is also helping others learn his way of life so they can become like him. Discipleship is both and, not one or the other. The goal of discipleship is to nurture and mature and equip others with everything they need so that they can love God and love others and help other people do the same. The disciple disciples. Being a disciple of Jesus is more than just living a life of, God, of love in front of God, in front of other people. It's also imparting that life of love so that those people you're imparting it to can also impart it to others. The disciple makes new disciples. Now there's a difference, I know, between making a Christian and making a disciple. Making a Christian is something that only really God can do. And that's not something we're ever called to do. We're not, we are called to witness to God through Christ, what he's done for us. We're told to proclaim the gospel of Christ, but we are never in scripture told to convert people. And the reason we're never told to do that is because we can't do that. Only God can do that. We're told to make disciples. What does the Great Commission say? Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the way of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything that I've commanded you. We tend to think of baptism as a standalone event, as a one and done kind of ritual. Baptism is an entering into a life lived in the reality of what Jesus made possible. David Stern, a well-known biblical scholar and a Messianic Jew, has written a translation of the Bible called the Complete Jewish Bible. I highly recommend it. His notes make an excellent resource for getting into the Jewish thought behind the teachings of the New Testament authors. And he translates Matthew 18, 19, the Great Commission, this way. Therefore... Go and make people from all nations into disciples, immersing them into the reality of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Puts a different spin on things, doesn't it? What baptism symbolizes, immersing people into the reality of the Father and Son and the Holy, of the Holy Spirit, is done by teaching them everything Jesus commanded, that means imparting the knowledge of what Jesus commanded and teaching them to obey everything that Jesus commanded. That means imparting the practice of what Jesus commanded. Jesus is commissioning his disciples to be the rabbi who would impart the knowledge and practice of his way of life. Now, what on earth does that mean? A rabbi took on disciples so that he could teach them his yoke, his interpretation of scripture. And his way of life was the practical living out of his yoke. 
through sharing and experiencing everyday life together, they would discuss and debate and question how scripture was to be applied and lived out in any given situation. The rabbi's life was open to the disciple so that they could watch and learn how he applied scripture to daily life. And the rabbi would watch and guide the disciple as he watched them live. The goal was not only to incarnate to them, but to replicate in them the way of life so that the disciple would be fully equipped to be rabbis themselves who would take on their own disciples and repeat the process with other people. Are you following me? The author of Hebrews takes his original audience to task because they're still only learners and not teachers in Hebrews 5.12. He says, in fact, though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you the elementary truths of God's word all over again. You need milk, not solid food. Disciples who've been learning for a long time, but who never begin to teach who never begin to impart what they know to others are like children who are old enough to have solid food but are still on a diet of milk. When Jesus called his disciples, he entered into a relationship with them where he imparted his yoke and his way of life with them. And when he commissioned them, he was saying that they were ready to be the rabbi and make disciples themselves on his behalf. Disciples impart, they replicate, they duplicate, they make new disciples. As I said at the opening of this sermon series on discipleship, the church is not in the greatest shape right now. And we're all, I think, the church is in pretty much universal agreement on that point. And I know some have been trying to spin uh, the research so it doesn't look so bad. Some blame it on the government. Some blame it on the economy or on the rise of secularism. Others think it's a shortage of sound biblical teaching or a matter of providing the right set of programs or services to entice people to come to church. And those may play a little part, but I don't think they're the big reasons at all. John Kimball, the director of church development for the Four Seas, a small congregational denomination, I think hit the nail on the head when he said, I fear we've raised a generation of professional Bible students, ever learning and clarifying, but never practicing what they've been taught. We do really well with encouraging illumination, loving God. We talk about the importance of incarnation, loving others, but we don't spend much time on impartation, making and maturing disciples. And while we may nod our heads in agreement that Christians should make disciples, the reality is that most Christians leave that work to pastors and missionaries, to the professionals. This thinking that the pastors, missionaries, and those who have the spiritual gift of evangelism are the people who are primarily responsible for having and making disciples is the result of taking the Great Commission and making it small and complicated instead of seeing it as big as Jesus wanted it seen and as simple as Jesus wanted it understood. We keep asking, what do we need to do? What do we need to offer people so that they come back to church? That's the wrong question. The problem is not how to get people into church. The problem is how do you get the church to go out to the people? The only difference, or let's, let me qualify that, the biggest difference, 
between the Apostle Paul and us is that Paul was called to plant churches and write 13 letters that have become part of Scripture. But as far as Jesus is concerned, we are no less responsible to impart Jesus' yoke as a way of life than Paul was. We have the same spirit that Paul did. And Jesus is no less with us than he was with him. And we have the same promise. Surely I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. Like that motor of mine that lets the controls talk to the AC in my car, impartation is an essential part of the Christian life. And without it, you can't really do the Christian life very well. Francis Fenlon wisely reminds us that while we can listen to endless sermons about Christian growth and become perfectly familiar with the language, we can be as far from its attainment as ever. But be careful about your motives in this eager chase after knowledge. You already have more knowledge than you can use. You would do better to put into practice what you already know. How we deceive ourselves when we suppose that we are growing in grace because our vain curiosity is being gratified by the enlightenment of our intellect. We need to realize that there is an organic, essential relationship between the great commandment and the great commission. Jesus says in John 14, 21, whoever has my commands and keeps them is the one who loves me. His commands are summed up in loving God, loving others, and making disciples. What makes a Christian healthy and vital and attractive is when illumination and incarnation and impartation are all present and encouraged and cultivated in his or her life. And what makes a church healthy and vital and attractive is when all those are present and encouraged and cultivated. And while it's true that having more people come through the door on any given Sunday is not any sure sign that a church is spiritually healthy, any church that is spiritually healthy is going to have more people coming through the doors because illumination leads to incarnation, which naturally leads to impartation. And if that isn't going on, something is wrong. And that church is going to find itself struggling. Each of us, even me, came into the kingdom of God because somebody shared the gospel with us, right? Somebody did. Yes, God opened the door and brought you in. He opened the door and brought me in. Why, I still don't know, but I'm glad that he did. He used somebody to bring you in. Are we doing that with anybody? Someone imparted that knowledge to you. Each of us who has grown and matured in our own walk with Christ have done so because we've benefited from other Christians who are walking with us. Are we doing that with anybody? My mentor and spiritual father, Charlie Jones, said, you're going to be the same person five years from now that you are today, except for two things. The people you meet and the books you read. And I think he was right. But I think, if I can paraphrase him, I think it's also true to say this. Your love for God will be the same five years from now, except for two things. Learning to love others as yourself and learning to make disciples. Let's commit to doing that together. Amen?